4 is, is an image of childlike dependence. Psalm 104 invites us to, to think of creation like a baby hungrily um, straining towards it, his mother's breast. And so when God generously provides, uh, the psalmist adds, creatures eagerly scoop up that provision. And, and he uses language that is totally um, similar and reminds us of Exodus 16 when it describes Israel, Israel's acts of, of collecting uh, and gathering manna. And so in this kind of vivid imagery uh, of this provision, it invites us to think of God's hand as open, right? And God doesn't have a clenched fist, and, and God doesn't, um, he isn't miserly or angry with it. He's this generous God who, who provides and sustains. And Psalm 104 reminds us that God is very generous, which is an attribute, I think, that sometimes we as worshipers miss. And we'll get to that in just a minute. I guess all this to point out that, therefore, all of creation praises God. Now, I have to be honest and admit to you that I do not know how all of creation does that. I I can't understand how all of non-human creation exercise the praising and glorifying of God. Right? For, For example, it doesn't seem to me that this is how a groundhog praises God. I mean, but it, instead it does it in some sort of groundhogian way, which I'm not quite exactly sure I can put my finger on. I mean, I know how I do it, right? I know how I praise God, but it doesn't tell me exactly how all of creation does it. Nor can I tell exactly how God receives, in some sense, the praise of creation, right? But, but the fact that I don't understand how it happens doesn't prevent me from believing that it happens. Right? It's enough to affirm what Psalm 104 says, right? That every creature praises God by being who God has created them to be. And so as I look forward uh, to the day when, according to, to Revelation 5, when every creature in heaven and on earth, in the sea and, and even under the sea, not just every human creature, not just every angelic voice, but every creature in all of creation will be singing the praises of God and of the Lamb of God. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. So God is glorified in this praise of creation, but God is also glorified somehow in the fullness of creation. Psalm 24, verse verse 1, there's this lovely emphasis, I think, that is sometimes obscured in our English translations of the Hebrew word that is, the filling of, or, or the filling. And sometimes we just, uh, you know, translate the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Kind of this catchphrase. Um, but, but even better is, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. And, and the way that the word gets used there, uh, and sometimes is, is compared to how it gets used in the prophets like Isaiah and in the Psalms and elsewhere, is often linked closely to the glory of God. The earth in all of its fullness. Or in Psalm 50, verse verse 12, all the creatures on the hill are mine. To me belong the world and all its fullness. And and I wonder if starting to understand it in this way gives a bit of a different nuance to Isaiah 6, verse 3. Right? That that great song of the seraphim that are they're they're in the temple at, at the call of Isaiah, right? You remember what they were singing? Uh, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, is the Lord of hosts. And then our trans- translations in English often put it, put it this way. The whole earth is full of his glory. And, and we think of somehow sometimes earth and glory as kind of two different realities here. But, but the literal Hebrew is the filling of all the earth, his glory. And so one possible reading um, it's, it's in the margin of the New American Standard Version, is that the fullness of the earth, which in part at least, is the fullness of or constitutes the glory of God. So when we experience fullness, we're experiencing the glory of God. The, the fullness of life on earth is the fullness of God. And so gl- God's glory then gets seen in the teeming abundance of biodiversity even on our planet. 
a number of years ago, Ellen and I kayaked uh, through Dolomite Narrows, Burnaby Narrows off Moresby Island in Haida Gwaii. Uh, that's not us. That's just a picture I found on the internet. Of, uh, but uh, we, we had film camera selfies weren't in vogue quite yet. So, but the point is that in that area, the amount of biomass in the intertidal zone is apparently as great as anywhere in the world per square meter. You can't walk at low tide here um, b- because you'll kill something with every single step. And it's teeming with life. And it's full. And there's just this something, there's something about life on earth that's, that's part of the glory of God, that God's glory is seen somehow in this fullness. Um, and that God's glory can be seen and experienced somehow in the fullness of his creation. And so his glory then kind of gets mediated to us through creation, and we live in this glory-filled earth. And of course, uh, as soon as I say that, some of you get a little bit, you know, kind of the heebie-jeebies come, and um, and we want to be careful, of course, right? Not to succumb to pantheism or something like that. This this is not to suggest that the glory of God is nothing more than just uh, the totality of creation. No, the, the psalm says very carefully, you have set your glory above the heavens. There's this transcendence of God's glory that's way beyond creation. But what I think is being affirmed here at the very least is that the glory of God is seen in all his works and the fullness thereof, as, as Psalm 104 puts it. And if that's true, right? if something of the glory of God is manifest in the fullness of the planet, in the fullness of God's creation, then then surely the negative consequences, right, is that those things which destroy creation needlessly actually somehow diminish the glory of God, which is a rather serious thing to be guilty of. So so creation then, it's not only good because God made it so, but in all of its created goodness, it also, together in its fullness, praises and gives glory to God to the extent that it is able, and it's in its fullness that it does so, in its completeness, in its shalom. And so given these truths, of course, about the relationship between God and his creation, whatever then destroys creation diminishes the praise and glory of God. Psalm says, may the glory of the Lord endure forever. And so Psalm 104's hymn of adoration concludes with this prayer to the creator and sustainer of creation. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. And so God's creation, uh, God's creatures uh, may sometimes be fragile or even short-lived depending completely upon God for his generous provision but still, the psalmist prays that, that, that God's glory won't be fragile, that it will outlast even the creation as we know it. And then the, the psalmist, in this kind of loving, poetic, but perhaps surprising turn, also prays that God will rejoice in God's works. That God will rejoice in God's works. How often do you think about God rejoicing? I mean, maybe you think about God as punishing, Maybe you think about God as forgiving or God as being just or, or angry or loving. But how often do you think about God rejoicing or delighting in things? But, but, but here it is in the psalm. The psalmist invites us to think of God's care for what God makes, not as some sort of drudgery, right? But as something that God takes great pleasure and delight and joy in. And I think here's the key for us in terms of our own creation care. If, if God enjoys creation, if God enjoys his creatures, then maybe we, God's children, maybe, maybe our own care for creation is something not just to be endured, not just to be something suffered through, but what if we too then enjoyed partnering with God as we celebrate the abundance of, with which God fills God's world. I mean, what's our chief end, right? To glorify God, to enjoy, to serve him forever. Same goal as all of creation, right? To glorify God. 
Now, we heard part of this next quote uh, last week, uh, and I kind of alluded to it even in the children's message, but it's worth repeating, especially in the context of relationship. Enjoying the God who enjoys creation. Uh, Ed, Ed Brown writes this, My biggest reason for caring for God's creation has nothing to do with the extent or severity of the crisis, the number of people affected, or even the ultimate future of the human race. It has to do with one simple fact. I know the God who made it all, and I love him. I love him. God has made his glory known throughout the fullness of all creation. To diminish creation is somehow to diminish the God who made it. As, as Proverbs 14 uh, uh, puts it, whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their creator. And, and so whatever we do to other people, we do in some sense to God and the image of God in them. And so too, how we treat creation, how we treat any creature is a direct reflection of how we treat their creator. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. I speak these words to you in the name of our glorious creator God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, we glorify God imperfectly, uh, but that should never stop us from glorifying him. Uh, And so um, just as a little um, video I'm going to show you, here is one person's effort to glorify God in in one small way. So we'll, uh, we'll let this 